This is a version of the talk on mathematical bead weaving that I gave at the Gathering for Gardener in March 2012. My name is Gwen Fisher. I am a bead weaver, and I use beads to represent mathematical objects of many types. I weave beads together with a needle and thread, one stitch at a time. Sometimes when people talk about beads, they mean stringing beads in a one-dimensional pattern to make necklaces and bracelets. Bead weaving is not that. It has more dimensions. My materials are simply beads and thread. I might use one type of bead or combine together beads in many sizes and colors. In theory, any connected set of bead weaving can be completed with one long thread, but multiple lengths are used in larger pieces of beading. My tools include very thin needles, scissors for cutting the thread, a pair of pliers to tug the needle through tight holes, and a mat for the beads so they don't roll around when I pick them up with my needle. Now a bead is anything with a hole, and a hole can be thought of as an oriented line segment in two or three dimensions. So rather than thinking of a bead as the glass or other material it is made from, I think of a bead as its hole. Thinking this way allows me to arrange the bead holes onto mathematical objects that are made up of line segments. Good examples include the two-dimensional tilings of the plane. Here are the three regular tilings of the plane, drawn with one pink dot or a pink bead on each blue edge of the tiling. In the photos, I show the same three tilings woven with four millimeter glass beads. These weaves are quite common, especially the middle one, using the regular tiling by squares. Bead weavers call this stitch right angle weave, or just raw for short. Raw is so common, in fact, that many people call all of these weaves and many others right angle weave, even though most flat tilings have no right angles in them. When I bead a tiling, in most cases, I call it just an angle weave, and right angle weave is one special case. Now if you get creative about which tilings you use and how you place the beads on the edges or even around the vertices of a tiling, you can find an infinite number of beautiful flat angle weaves. I have found that using tilings is helpful for me to organize and reason about the plethora of possibilities. Inspired by the many possibilities, I made this wall piece that I call Chaos and Order. Many different angle weaves make one long piece of beaded fabric, where one design morphs into the next in some places and crashes into chaos in others. I started with freeform hexagon angle weave, but not so freeform as to lose the pretty patterns in it. I purposely started with a few odd bits, rings of five instead of six, and a couple of larger beads just to make things interesting. Then I spent hours trying to fix my mistakes by making adjustments so that everything would fit and lie flat. What results is a crazy patchwork design that is a combination of order and chaos, where one pattern drifts into the next, as do the colors. Now you can also orient the bead holes in three dimensions, like placing one bead hole on every edge of a cube. A beaded cube is itself a bead with holes in each face, and we call this more generally a beaded bead. The beaded dodecahedron is another well-loved example, but don't stop there. You can weave any polyhedron as a beaded bead. You can place one bead hole on each edge of the polyhedron, and then the thread connects the beads at the vertices of the polyhedron, and the holes in the bead beaded bead are the faces. Lastly, you can add a core bead if needed to keep the beaded bead from collapsing. Such basic beaded polyhedra are fine, but I like hollow beaded beads with really large holes. And with the simplest weave, I use one bead per edge and no beads per vertex. With infinity weave, however, I use one bead per edge and 12 beads per vertex. The beads at the vertices are woven in two layers, and as long as the valence at each vertex is three, this arrangement of beads is quite stable. After I beaded a lot of different polyhedra, I started to classify them by symmetry type rather than by polyhedral type. You can represent all 14 classes of finite three-dimensional point groups with beaded beads. My favorite is the cube octahedral group. But the full prismatic group seems to be the most intuitive symmetry for a beaded bead. The symmetry of pyramids make for pretty flowers and rose window designs that are perfect for pendants. And you can do others too, like these, which show anti-prism symmetry. You can also weave together lots of little polyhedra, as in this third generation Sierpinski tetrahedron. Its shadow shows a Sierpinski triangle if you hold it just right. When I showed my little beaded model to Paul Brown, he said, let's make it big, and he rendered this model of it in SolidWorks with baseball bats for the edges. The following two summers, we brought our sculpture Bat Country to the Burning Man Art Festival as our gift to the community. Bat Country contains 384 softball bats, 130 balls, and a whole lot of steel. 
It weighs close to 2,200 pounds. It stands 22 feet tall and has easily held the weight of over 30 people at once. Now back to beading with little beads. You can bead a row of cubes to make boxes and jacks. Since the beadwork is flexible, you can bead things like the impossible triangle of Roger Penrose, and now the impossible is merely unlikely. With rows of cubes, you can weave orderly tangles like the Borromean link, and different stitches can be used to make four intersecting triangles. You can even weave strange topological surfaces like this one, and hyperbolic surfaces like this one. In the end, it's all just a few beads and thread, but within these simple materials, the possibilities are infinite.